ZipRecruiter is a proud sponsor of Without Warning Podcast. Use code word WOW and search for jobs anytime, anywhere. The Lauren Agee case was hastily closed by authorities, but many questions remain. Come behind the curtain with private investigator Sheila Waisaki as she uncovers the truth about what happened to Lauren. This is Without Warning. Warning. The following episode contains details about sexual violence and elements that are graphic in nature. On the last episode, you suffered through terrible audio. The audio was done by Mike and Sherry Smith. Never in a million years did they think their audio or their recording of their daughter's autopsy would be on a podcast. The only way Lauren has gotten any justice is through this podcast. Imagine being the mother and father listening to the autopsy review. Yes, the audio was awful. It was so important for you to hear what they heard early on in the investigation. Mark Gillespie's review of the episode will be part of the Patreon spy level. On this week's episode, I am not playing what we originally planned. The audio that was turned over to me is being reviewed by attorneys. As soon as I have the green light, I will play it for you. I appreciate the tips and audio that's being turned over. On this week's episode, you're going to hear audio between Sherry Smith, Chris Yarchuk, Matthew Robinson, and myself. There are several things I want to say about Chris Yarchuk. Chris was the off-duty police officer from White County in charge of security at Wakefest. Listen to what Chris says about when he was taken up to the campsite, which way Aaron Lilly wanted to go, and which way Chris went. Chris is a police officer that you want showing up on a crime scene or an accident or if you're in trouble. He is the best representation of a police officer. Chris Yarchuk is a hero. Chris is very uncomfortable with that label, but he should own it. He and Ryan Melanson are both heroes. Deputy Sheriff, White County, Tennessee, in the city of Sparta. And at the time of Wakefest, I was um, the lead police officer. Wakefest is a professional and amateur um, event that they hold on the lake where people come in to win prize money for um, wake surfing, buying wakeboards. How many people generally come to Wakefest? Um, well, every year it's gotten larger and larger. Um, we started out, it was, you know, a thousand, a couple thousand, now 5,000. I mean, it's, it's getting bigger and, and next year we're projecting eight to 10,000 people to show up. I, it's an event on the lake and there's a bunch of sponsors there, Bud Light's there, obviously, um, um, Red Bull's there. So you have all the, the usual big event stuff and being that it's on the water in the middle of summer and hot, um, you've got the girls on the jet skis running around their bikinis. You got a, a bunch of private boaters coming in to watch the event also in swimwear. Um, men and women alike. So you'll get the European man swimsuit. You'll get the typical American baby bikini woman swimsuit. So the European male swimsuit is what? <laughs> <laughs> Lake Fest is on Center Hill Lake, on the southeast side of the city of Smithville. Um, and it's put on by uh, Pates Ford Marina Fish Lips. Also, um, Middle Tennessee Motorsports. TNT, um, right? TNT Water Sports. Um, yeah, there's a few big sponsors that come can collaborate to, to put it on. Huge economic event for Smith, though, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I was making my rounds, so I'd walk around the outside of the of Fish Lips, and she saw me and just come running up and told me your name, and um, I'm going to school and, you know, in criminal justice, and I want to be a cop, and I want to be a lawyer, and just – going on and on about all kinds of stuff, asked me a bunch of questions about being a police officer and if it's fun and what do you do? And I mean, obviously part of what I do private duty was how I came into contact with her, but 
life of the party, just outgoing. She's act like she didn't know a stranger, very bubbly, very personal, bright, excitable voice, just very intuitive. There were three of them sitting in the plastic Adirondack chairs, Aaron and Hannah, and then there was a little German Shepherd dog with them, and then uh, Lauren. Um, and I didn't even realize Christopher was with him until later on when he kept coming back over because I'd seen him throughout the night talking to two or three different women, sitting in the windowsill, his hand on one, trying to dance with another. And he's just roaming around the whole place, just being a 20-whatever-year-old guy, I guess. They didn't really seem to have a lot of money. They Earlier on, uh, you really didn't see many of them with drinks there. But as the night progressed, you could tell they were they were under the influence of something. Mm-hmm. So. Time. Yeah, I saw Lauren um, Saturday night several times uh, at Fish Slips after the Wake Fest event had ended and the nightlife started. Lauren did stand out. She was very uh, bubbly, outgoing, excitable. She was out um, on the side of the restaurant on the dock portion where the boats pull up, um, just twirling around, dancing, jumping around, having fun uh, to the music. Seeing Lauren and then seeing who she was with later found out it was Hannah and Aaron. They really just kept to themselves. They just stayed close together. They weren't off wandering around. Um, they weren't apparently social. They were just sitting there between themselves talking with their German Shepherd puppy. And Lauren was off to the side and kind of just wandering back and forth and watching the band and dancing on the dock. And uh, Chris was wandering around perusing. Chris did in my mind just because of the fact that he I saw him with multiple people, multiple women. And he's wandering around between different girls, holding hands with this one, rubbing legs with that one, trying to dance with this other one. So to me, that I was just kind of like, well, it's a small place. Everybody's going to see what you're doing. I mean, you're not really doing yourself any favors, but being security and it's a business, they're there to make money. So when you have people come in like Hannah and Aaron, and they're sitting out back, taking up chairs, not purchasing beers, they're in line of the band, which is probably 20 yards away at most. My thing is, hey, we want to are paying customers to be in the chairs and get the spots and see the things. But uh, being that it's at a marina and people can just pull in on their boats and listen, I mean, there's... I had Chris describe what he saw when he came upon Lauren's scene. From a distance, you saw bright pink and black. And upon getting closer, um, pink shorts and a black shirt, sleeveless, uh, like a tank top. And she was at the waterline from her bottom to... Um, even top of her head, she was at the surface. So the coroner is uh, a master diver, and so and he's a friend of my husband's. So mm-hmm. what he said to us when he first examined her body was he said, wow, she must have gone really, really deep to be in cold water because her body was so preserved. You see what I, where I'm going with this? How long do you think she was actually in the water? The last time I saw her was 2 o'clock, and it was 14 or 15 hours later when I saw her. I believe that she was probably in the water no more than... I think I think they moved her, and I think that they did it with as much darkness as they had available to them. So yeah. depending, I mean, it, it, anywhere, I would say from dusk, an hour before dusk, so anywhere between, I would say 5 to 7 in the morning, but with the, as much darkness as they had available. So I would say immediately, but... Well, Aaron, there are witnesses that he left Wakefest by himself to go back earlier in the afternoon on Sunday. Is there a possibility that they had maybe stored Lauren's body and then he just put <clears> her <throat> in the water? Because her, she doesn't even look waterlogged. No. Okay? I mean, and there's no predatory bites. You know, when you have, like, catfish and fish and, you know, the... There's, there was nothing. Um, yeah, and that would, typically, that would be... If she was in the water 12, 15 hours, wouldn't there have been marks on her body, especially if this was a fishing hole? The the type of fish that were back in there, I mean, back in that... I just don't see it unless it's a two to three days where I've seen it before, where um, before a person has floated up even, it's their skin will start to peel, the body will start putting off a, a smell right. or a scent in the water, um, which triggers a bite or a response from fish to But to you eat, saw but her body. It did not look like it had been in the water for 15 hours. No, no, it didn't. Okay. No. 
And you have seen a body that's been in the water for multiple hours. Oh, yeah, and days. And days. Yeah. So you, you have experience. Yeah, I've seen multiple bodies that have been in the water for anywhere from a few hours up to a few days. And depending on how deep the water is, the temperature of the water, the body builds up gases. So when the body builds up enough gases to be neutrally buoyant or buoyant, um, and at that time, the body starts to rise. So then the closer you get to the surface, the warmer the water is, the more gases build up rapidly, and then you, you float. So a body back in that cove in anywhere from possibly 12 feet to, to 5 feet um, where she was found at the shore, the water temperature may have been 78 to 83 degrees that day. You're, you're not going to float. Even if you have drowned, you're not going to float from your bottom to the, to the top of your head. You're going to be shoulders and head floating. From a gas buildup buoyancy state, you're not going to be I mean that. I asked Chris if he felt the police acted too quickly on declaring this an accident. I absolutely believe with everything that I am that the police acted too quickly and um, assumed it was a simple accident. But in my experience in, in life and in the police department and as an active diver for 12 years, I knew right away the countless bodies I pull out of the water for for families and departments and counties and cities that Lauren didn't drown. I asked Chris to talk about Aaron Lilly and what he remembered. Him and um, Christopher both were in the canoe behind the houseboats in line of the body. So as soon as we went around the corner, they started screaming and paddling. To me, that was number one red flag. Right, right. And, uh, yeah. So it was probably Aaron and Chris that went back early. I, I honestly, I wouldn't. The tarps that they had there would draw so much attention if it was the blue tarp um, somewhere down below. If anything, if they did move the body down and put it in the woods somewhere, um, they probably would have just brushed it in or put leaves over it or something. But it's so secluded back there that you could just toss something behind a stump or a log and right. no one would know the difference. No, I've never seen anybody back in there walking around um, right. that far back in the cold even hardly leave the, the fish back in there. One thing you said about the cove, though, that's a good place to place a body, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. It's out of line of sight from the marina. It's out of line of sight from normal boat traffic, excluding um, someone putting in just further west and north of the marina. Uh, there's a little boat ramp, and that's hardly ever used there. It's it's pretty steep, and it's a shallow launch, so it's you could lay something on the side of that bank and no one would see it for weeks, probably. Unfortunately for them, Lynn and Dylan went fishing that day. But let me ask this question, and I'll get back to these in a second. So if you're on top of the cliff, Mm -hmm. she had pink shorts on. Oh, yeah. Could you see pink from the top of the cliff? I I didn't look down there when I went up to get um, Lauren's ID. Just forefront of my mind was, get her ID so that way when the local authorities get there, we would have all the stuff they need to immediately positively identify the body. I mean, at that point, and I hadn't even seen that we didn't roll or touch her or nothing. So I didn't know for a hundred percent sure that it was her, uh, was Lauren in the water at that point until TWRA uh, got the okay to pull the body out. My question is this, do they normally transport bodies after pulling them out of the water face down? No, and everybody that I've recovered with TWRA, um, typically we, depending on where the body is and how far along it's decomposed, we um, mesh bag them at the bottom and then pull them up and then hand them off to TWRA and then they'll, two or three of those guys will lift the bag up and smash the water drains out, leaving just the body and it's always face up. So to that point, they used a hook, some big hook. To pull her. Did you see that? I literally do not think that any procedures were followed correctly involving this. I mean, it, it was almost like, to me, this is my impression, that it was set up from the very beginning to make this go away. So was it Jeremy Taylor who was the one who went up to uh, with Aaron to the campsite? I went with Aaron to the campsite um, initially, and he tried to walk me to the tent. And I saw hammocks and chairs, so I the first thing I came to was that little bluff section, 
So I walked up there first just to see. Uh, I don't know why I did. I just felt like I needed to be there. I went up there and looked. And I saw, well, there's Lauren shoes. And, well, there's her sweater. Um, there's another chair with nothing in a hammock, nothing. Okay. So I walked down with the same shoes that Lauren had on them. I'd be the black with rhinestones on them. The floppy things. So I'd walk down that bluff, walk go across, and then up the other side to the tent where, well, that's where all our stuff was. Her purse was in there, and, and he went in there and knew where her purse was, got in her wallet, got her ID. I'm going camping with a bunch of ladies and guys. I'm not going to know where all the girls' purses are and all their stuff is put. I just, I wouldn't know that. That's not my... The pictures from the crime scene show her shoes, the purse, her keys all laid out underneath one of the hammocks. Over by the tent. Over by the tent. Moved. Yeah, it was moved. moved. Yeah. Wow. I told them exactly where her stuff was. No one even processed that crime scene to my that I know of. When I went to Wake Fest that first year, Chris was the one who kept saying to me there were two crime scenes. And I had him show me on the computer <clears throat> the second crime scene. Before that, we didn't know there were two who locations. Moved your shoes? The cops were up there then. Jeremy well, Taylor and the DeKalb County Police. But also Hannah, we have pictures of Hannah yeah. and Chris up there. I'm sorry, they Hannah and Aaron. Yeah. Now, that's also violating. And then the second time they went up there, or when they went up there with the department, they were wearing life jackets in some pictures. Why Why were they wearing life jackets? I have no idea. And if they had them on with the, in the boats and then they just kept them on when they went up, I, I thought that was odd to me. But, okay, you're not supposed to let people around a crime scene because you, you can contaminate evidence, right? Yeah. Ryan told us it was never roped off. Is that correct? It was never. I hadn't, I didn't see any up there. Um, so after I got the ID uh, with Aaron, we went up to the tent, got the ID, went back down. Um, Aaron and Chris were in a boat with Harry and Ryan. Mm -hmm. And I had a TWRA officer take me to Hannah immediately. And that's when I audio taped the, uh, my iPhone our conversation on the front of the houseboat. Okay, to that point, this is a side note. Deanna always wondered why you were playing on your phone. She didn't know <laughs> you taped it. Well, what I was doing was I was pretending to be texting and stuff right. and being nonchalant with Hannah so she didn't feel intimidated by me. That way she would speak more freely, I felt. And she did. She did. Yes. Daily Harvest has come on board to sponsor without warning. My travel schedule is so busy. I am in town for three hours, enough time to shower, repack, and get back to the airport. Exactly what happened two weeks ago. I flew into town, went to my home. I had enough time to do the Daily Harvest Oat Bowl. I was able to walk in the door, add almond milk into the container, Pour that into a saucepan. In six minutes, I had oats, fruit, superfoods, and spices. Everything that I needed in order to sustain me until the next day. I was able to eat it on the way to the airport, and when I got onto the plane, I was full and ready to go. Go to daily-harvest.com and enter promo code WOW to get three cups free in your first box. That's promo code WOW for three free Daily Harvest cups at daily-harvest.com. Daily-harvest.com. Everything stays fresh in your freezer until you're ready to eat it. Choose from more than 50 nourishing options for any time of day ready-to-blend smoothies, savory harvest bowls, soups, and more. Each single-serving cup takes one step to prepare. Just add water or milk to a smoothie or heat up a harvest bowl. All of daily harvest ingredients are carefully sourced for maximum nourishment and flavor. You can actually see all of the ingredients when you open the cup. Daily Harvest is the easiest, most delicious way to load up on fruits and vegetables first thing in the morning, before bed, and anytime in between. Go to daily-harvest.com and enter promo code WOW to get three cups free in your first box. An officer on a scene, you find a, you discover a body. Is it, at that point, is it a crime scene or... Even if you feel that it's an accident, is it a crime scene at that point? Even if I don't find a body and there's something reported, 
it is a crime scene until I prove it differently. Everything's a crime scene until it's proven not. That way, if it was, and I didn't treat it that way, I contaminate stuff. I messed stuff up. I failed somebody. Would you say that's 101 police work? Absolutely 101. Like day um, one stuff? That it, Yeah, that's what I was, yes. The um, Ronald Foreman, uh, OJ stuff. I mean, all the big cases in the headlines were the police walk in and mess everything up. So in our department, and me as a person, I don't want a family to have to go through that. So I typically will stay back and just observe, look, see, smell, um, make mental notes, point in, you know, get the area taped off. And then when lead investigators show up, I tell them this is what I saw, smelled, tasted, looked at, with the wind blew in my face, whatever, you know, whatever you, you have available to you and your senses. So at that point, you move in carefully taking notice of things that are out of place or maybe even not out of place, but just where they are. You take pictures all the way in, you take pictures all the way out because the pictures are in most of the times are where you're going to see the things that you missed. And you're the, you're the guy on the scene, the first guy yes, working sir. in the capacity of an off duty mm-hmm. officer working security. Correct. Are you responsible for, do you have to do your job as a law enforcement officer when you come upon that stuff, even if you're off duty? Absolutely. If in the state of Tennessee, if I'm off duty, if I'm out of jurisdiction, if I come upon something, I have to preserve it. I have the duty to act. It. Um, if I don't, then I take my certification. But if I'm a sworn, I swore that I would uphold and protect the law of the state of Tennessee. And the law of the state of Tennessee is north, south, east, to west. And when other officers who are uh, when these guys show up, you then have to defer to them. Yeah. So when when if something is found in a, a crime, an incident, uh, something I've observed or seen, or uh, we call them local law enforcement, then when they arrive, it's their jurisdiction and they take over. Offer them as information, an opinion. It's up to them what they do with it. Who you know, I don't. Have a so say. that group of guys that comes in, I don't know how many it was. How many officers show up? Probably up close to five officers were there. Um, and then you have also um, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency came in on their boats, TWRA, because they were in, in the area anyway for Wake Fest. Um, I think we had three boats come in from TWRA. I mean, the total there must have been at least 10, 10 law enforcement officials in that capacity on scene. How many were on the bluff? After you were done, you initially went up there. I'm wondering how many DeKalb County deputies were up there. Um, that'd be a great question for Ryan Melanson, because um, at that point I was with um, a, a TWA officer with Hannah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because if he saw her stuff in the second campsite, why was it moved? Why was in the, the police file pictures? It's all laid out neatly in here. Well, and another thing is too: did they even go to the first set of chairs and hammocks, or did they just follow Kristen and Aaron right to the tent? Where there was nothing. Where they were leading because them if away. Hannah's saying, oh, well, Chris and Hannah were in his hammock. Well, that's where her shoes were. There's where a, cha- a second chair was. There is a single hammock. Right. And if you're with someone, you're not going to be right outside of a tent More spending time. So I mean, I didn't even, like, she had a blue, short, yellowy flower. Never, never came back. Like, and I never even saw that at the campsite. Because to me, it, I'm like, well, that's what she, I last saw her in. Where is it here somewhere? And I never did. What was the last thing you saw Lauren in? She had the black flip flops with clear rhinestone gems, apparently on the the, toe, the straps for the toes, um, and the blue sundress kind of thing. The first articles of clothing that I recognized uh, walking up to the campsite were Lauren's shoes, um, the black flip flops with the rhinestones, and then zip up sweater that she had on hoodie that she had with her that night. Shoes were in front of the chair, placed like she just slipped them off, and then the the sweater was placed over the back of the chair. Um, and could already moved on to the, where the tent was. Um, so in the purpose of retrieving the ID, I went over there where he was, um, which was a pretty good hike down, um, an elevation down to the flat, and then hike up again to the next elevation. Uh, where the tent was set up and there was also a couple more hammocks and chairs um, and he was in the tent at that time he walked in grabbed a purse between air mattresses and got the wallet out and came out and handed me the id was it chris or aaron aaron then later on um, in a photograph i noticed that all those items were in front of the tent on the ground just kind of 
laid in order. They weren't where they initially were or she had last left them. Lauren's shoes and sweater were moved over to the main campsite in front of the tent and they were laid out on the ground. That's the picture they're using as this is what we found. It is. Well, if it is, they're damn liars. <laughs> yeah, that's what they're saying. And Hannah got up in the morning and said she saw her shoes, her purse, and her stuff laid out right below the hammock. We had her testimony. No, absolutely not. Because it was, what, five in the afternoon? afternoon. Was, I mean, Aaron went in and got the purse out of the tent, and he tried to get me to go right to the tent, and I walked up and saw her shoes and coat on the back of that chair, like Chris's hammock area, where she told me in the recording that's where they were together. Now, this is before you talked to Hannah, correct, when you first went up there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Hannah was AWOL. Aaron and Chris were in the back of the, in the, holding on to a houseboat looking back in the cove. So as soon as we went past, they just started patting on yelling. So were you shocked that they declared um, this an accident? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, with the amount of marks on the body, some can would be consistent with a fall, but not with front, side, back, outside of arms, inside of arms, chest, neck in the front, neck in the back, top of the head. I mean, there's just too many injuries to obviously fall and I believe the the multiple injuries on the smaller lacerations, contusions, and obviously um, after um, um, the blood stopped moving, you're not going to have as many bruises. She most of the injuries came from her being drugged down the hill. In my opinion, I that's I will never not believe that. What would be the reasoning for them? not to do a thorough investigation. I have my theory. Um, inexperience, perhaps. Um, don't have the right people leading the investigation, um, not knowing what they're looking at. Is it a nuisance to have to do an investigation? Um, no, to do an investigation, in my personal professional opinion, has never been a nuisance. Now, there are certain people that keep bugging you about stuff when it's not in the time frame daily phone calls, daily emails, um, but then again, then you have to take the heart that that's a concerned family member, a concerned friend, a concerned, and people just want answers. So, um, and, t- and when, when you've done all you can do as law enforcement and turn stuff over to TBI for testing, or you turned it over, uh, waiting on fingerprint results, waiting on blood results, waiting on um, DNA results, um, you don't have answers. But if you never ask the questions to begin with, you're never going to have the right answers anyway. Were you ever questioned? I was not. Nobody ever approached you? Not after the initial day that we recovered the body, no. As a diver, as seeing these people together, as going to the first one up there, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm thinking. Lauren had nothing to do with Chris all night. Wasn't around him, wasn't together. It stinks. There's no, none, none of the smells good. Listen to Chris's next statement. On the day they found Lauren's body, this is what he suggested. And I suggested the rape kit. I suggested uh, DNA fingernails. You got to, like to the, the EMS, I'm like you got to preserve the fingernails. So you got to preserve whatever, if anything, you need to save that. You need to get the fingernails, but that's common knowledge. So, you know, in saying those things, obviously you think that they already know that at the sheriff's department that takes over and you think that they're going to do those things back to the treat it like a crime scene until it proved itself not to be. Um, but that's how I was trained when I, when I came in. I don't know who trained them or what their experience is with it and how many homicides or deaths or drownings or falls they I don't know what their statistics are. To be clear, you have seen bodies that have fallen down cliffs and into water. Yes. Okay. With the kind of injuries you sustain from that kind of fall, mm-hmm. is there any similarity to the kind of injuries you have if you would say have a, a bad motorcycle wreck? You know, say say you're, um, you're tumbling down a pavement. <clears throat> is it is it similar at all? Only in the area that you've fallen mm-hmm. down, um, but landing on asphalt Sliding down asphalt is a lot different than falling down and hitting at different heights, um, rock edges, logs, branches, moss, grass, sticks, whatever, whatever just the, the ground is different. So you would have scrapes, you would have cuts, depending on what's in the road. If you went through the median and there was a brick or a tire, car parts from a wreck. I mean, but Lauren's injuries, repeated injuries to the back of the head. It's one thing to fall once and get a dent, but to fall repeatedly and have four or five dents in the same spot. I've never seen that. The cuts, yeah, on the back of her head. And in my professional opinion, what it seemed to me was that she, her head was smashed into the ground multiple times.
sometimes someone was on top of her. One of the moments that struck me was when I asked him about the investigation and he broke down. This is a police officer who's very healthy, very robust physically and morally. And when I asked him about the investigation and Lauren's death, it struck to his core and soul and made him break down. I did not stop the recording. I wanted you to hear what a true police officer is about. This is a man who cared so much about an investigation that years later, it still upsets him. And I want to compare that to Sheriff Patrick Ray and Jeremy Taylor, who was supposed to take care of her investigation. How was Lauren failed by investigators? Do you want me to give you tissue? I have toilet tissue. No, uh, that's that's no. all I have here. I have like, so, le, uh, long flush lashes. Oh. Flush lashes. <laughs> Some that girls would kill for. So, Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'd love them. You okay? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Now, I, I want you to understand, we don't think by any stretch of the imagination that you failed in any capacity. You're Gosh, no, no. You I mean, are yeah, not Chris, when we. You're the hero, and yeah, I I don't want to you. My family, anyway. Well, <laughs> to a lot of people, you know, I've said that over and over. And Chris said to me this morning, he'd rather or texted me, he'd rather not even have have this happen. I'd rather not be a hero in a situation like this. So to me, I'd rather not even have happened. But we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you, Chris and Ryan. This and thank would, God. They would have gotten away with sweeping this under the rug. Oh, right. Wow. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. I mean, there's a simple answer, but it's just it's obvious to me and probably anybody that's heard anything about this case that law enforcement has failed Lauren thus far with justice. So It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. I firmly believe that we'll see it. I do too now with the recent happenings. I think that there'll be a lot less um, control. Mm -hmm. obviously, or no control. And I think that there'll be a lot of freedom there and people will feel safe to talk. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm hoping for. On the next episode, I'll continue my conversation with Chris Yarchuk. As always, I want to thank you all for listening to the podcast supporting the sponsors, and especially helping with the case. Once again, I want to thank Resonate Recording for bailing me out and getting my podcast out on time. Lauren's family gives their full permission for any and all details to be shared in hope that the truth will come out. If you know anything at all, call 1-888-599-0008 or email tips at sheilawysaki.com.